Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Barack Obama Thursday ordered the expulsion of 35 Russian diplomats, accusing them of spying. He slapped new sanctions on Russian agencies he accused of meddling in November's U.S. elections. Obama also ordered the closure of two Russian-owned estates, one on Long Island, the other in Maryland, that the White House says were used to gather intelligence. The sanctions came as the Obama administration made public a 13-page document produced by the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security outlining the government's charges of how Russian hackers penetrated U.S. institutions in a bid to undermine the campaign of Hillary Clinton. Russia responded angrily to the sanctions, saying initially it would expel 35 U.S. diplomats in return. This is Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Мы, конечно же, не можем оставить подобные выходки без ответа. Взаимность — это закон дипломатии. We cannot leave such steps unanswered. Reciprocity is a law of diplomacy and international affairs. Therefore, the Russian Foreign Ministry, together with our colleagues from other agencies, proposed to the President of the Russian Federation to declare 31 staff members of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and four diplomats from the U.S. Consulate General in St. Petersburg, persona non grata. Following those comments, however, Russian President Vladimir Putin said he would hold off on expelling diplomats for now and will wait to see if U.S. attitudes towards Russia change after Donald Trump's inauguration in January. The sanctions drew widespread bipartisan support among members of Congress. During a trip to Lithuania Thursday, South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham said they did not go far enough. I think the sanctions need to go beyond what it is today. I uh, believe they name, need to name Putin as an individual in his inner circle, because nothing happens in Russia without his knowledge or approval. President-elect Donald Trump Thursday continued to downplay charges of Russian meddling in November's election. Trump said in a short statement he would meet with top intelligence advisers next week for a briefing on Russia, but said the country should move on to, quote, bigger and better things. The statement echoed comments Trump made Wednesday during an impromptu news conference at his Mar-a-Lago estate. At Trump's side was former boxing promoter and convicted killer Don King, who waved a bundle of national flags as Trump took questions. What do you think generally about sanctions against Russia? I think we ought to get on with our lives. I think that computers have complicated lives very greatly. Uh, the whole you know, age of computer has made it where nobody knows exactly what's going on. We have speed. We have a lot of other things, but I'm not sure you have the kind of security that you need. But uh, I have not spoken with the senators, and I certainly will be over a period of time. Donald Trump spoke to reporters for several minutes during the two impromptu appearances on Wednesday. They've been described as Trump's first news conferences since November's election. In Syria, a ceasefire appears to be holding after the Russian, Iranian and Turkish broker truce came into effect at midnight. There were reports of fighting in the early morning hours before guns and mortars fell silent. Russian President Vladimir Putin touted the agreement as a major turning point in the nearly six-year-old civil war. Three documents have been signed. The first document is between the Syrian government and the armed opposition on a ceasefire on the territory of the Syrian Arab Republic. The second document is a complex of measures to control the ceasefire. And the third document is a statement of readiness to start peace talks on Syrian reconciliation. The U.S. did not participate in crafting the agreement. It's still not clear how many of the dozens of Syrian opposition groups agreed to the deal. The ceasefire doesn't include ISIS or the organization formerly known as the Al-Nusra Front. Turkey's military said Russian and Turkish warplanes bombed ISIS positions near al-Bab on Friday, killing 38 fighters, they said. In Turkey, a parliamentary commission has approved draft constitutional amendments that would abolish the office of the prime minister and give President Recep Tayyip Erdogan more powers. The changes are supported by Erdogan's party and are expected to be approved by lawmakers. It's the latest effort by Erdogan to consolidate his rule since Turkish officers launched an unsuccessful coup attempt last July. Erdogan has since jailed scores of journalists and pursued a brutal government crackdown aimed at Kurdish militants. Amnesty International estimates a half million 
people have been displaced by the conflict in Turkey's southeast. In India, at least nine miners are dead and two dozen more feared trapped under mud after a massive landslide at an open pit coal mine in the country's east. Rescuers said their efforts to reach the miners were delayed for hours due to bad weather and poor visibility. India is the world's third largest producer of coal and is on track to overtake the U.S. in coal consumption by 2030. In Charleston, South Carolina, convicted mass murderer Dylan Roof told a judge Wednesday he won't call witnesses or give evidence in his own defense when a jury returns next week to determine if he'll receive the death penalty. Roof is acting in his own defense after he fired his legal team. He was convicted earlier this month on 33 counts of federal hate crimes for murdering nine black worshipers, including a pastor, Clementa Pinckney, at the historic Emanuel AME Church in June of 2015. Meanwhile, a Charleston court has scheduled a March 1st retrial of Michael Slager, the white former North Charleston police officer, who's accused of murdering a black man during a traffic stop. Earlier this month, the judge declared a mistrial after a single juror refused to convict Slater of murdering Walter Scott, even though video clearly shows him shooting the 50-year-old man in the back. Last year, Slager and Dylan Roof were held in adjacent cells in Charleston's jail. In Missouri, a law set to take effect with the new year will allow felony charges to be brought against children who get into fistfights on school buses or on school property. Under the statute, students caught fighting could face third-degree assault charges and up to four years in prison, regardless of their age or grade level. Critics say Missouri's new law will worsen the state's school-to-prison pipeline and will disproportionately affect African Americans. Last year, a study by the UCLA Center for Civil Rights Remedies found black elementary school children in Missouri are suspended at higher rates than in any other state. In Arkansas, prosecutors seeking evidence against a Bentonville man charged with murder have obtained a warrant to receive data from his Amazon Echo, a voice-activated device that's always listening and often recording. James Andrew Bates says he's innocent of the murder of Victor Collins, who was found strangled in Bates' hot tub. Prosecutors hope to search audio recordings on Bates' Amazon Echo for clues. Lawyers for Amazon.com have refused to comply with the warrant, and technology experts say it's unlikely the device was recording at the time of the murder. But the case has drawn national attention and alarmed civil liberties groups. Bates' lawyer, Kimberly Weber, told USA Today, quote, I have a problem that a Christmas gift that is supposed to better your life can be used against you. It's almost like a police state, she said. In the Philippines, President Rodrigo Duterte said this week he was prepared to throw corrupt officials out of a helicopter, a practice he said he's personally done before. <laughs> If you are corrupt, I will fetch you to Manila using a helicopter, and I will throw you out. I have done this before. Why would I not do it again? It's the latest claim by the Philippines president to have personally committed murder. Earlier this month, Duterte said that while mayor of Davao City, he patrolled city streets on a motorcycle looking for opportunities to kill. As the Philippines' president, Duterte has launched a brutal so-called war on drugs that's seen thousands of people killed by police and vigilantes since the summer. And in Mexico, lawmakers are weighing whether to legalize medical marijuana in a move that could have big implications for a drug war that's killed more than 100,000 Mexicans over the last decade. On December 13th, Mexico's Senate overwhelmingly approved a bill that would allow the cultivation of marijuana for medical use and scientific study. The lower house of Mexico's Congress will now consider the measure. The debate comes in the wake of November's U.S. election, which saw voters in Massachusetts, Maine, Nevada and California join Washington and Colorado in allowing the use of recreation. Pot. This is Mexican Senator Roberto Zuart. México tiene que ya dar el paso de manera pronta. Debe de resolver esta discusión. Mexico needs to move forward and soon. We need to resolve this debate. It doesn't make any sense for us to continue with all these deaths while in the United States the use of marijuana is legal, especially because the trafficking of marijuana to the United States market represents approximately 40 percent of criminal gangs' income. It's a lot of money, and this money is used to finance other kinds of illicit activities. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world.